Ja, Nagetsi Henu Hadkesh Dikiang. My hat and name is Fox. Dang Esh the good night logging. I'm happy to see you. Welcome to the tenth edition of Haida Language and Etymology. Today we're going to be talking about the Haida title calendar, and this is related to the video we did last time on the Haida subsistence calendar. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend you watch that one before you watch this one. Um, previously we've talked about lunar calendars and how indigenous groups have used lunar calendars to plan subsistence activities and to plan um, preparedness for subsistence activities like getting materials ready so that you can go harvest things, baskets and um, such. So um, the tides are very important um, to the lunar calendar. As you can imagine, the tides are connected to the moon. Um, so we're just going to be over, going over some Haida language around the tides. Um, behavior on the shore and directions on the water because these are um, interrelated kind of to tidal subsistence and how we harvest um, tidal goods, right? So why don't we jump right into that? And then we're, we're going to go over some coastal vernacular phrases and stuff. So our first sentence is going to be Chawe Iwangang. It's a big run out. Chawe Iwangang. Iwangang. <laughs> then we're going to have Cho An Inas, the high tide on the full moon in May. So, um,. All, all of these different tides, especially the important tides, have their own names, much like the height of um, months do. So um, if you're living in Southeast Alaska, that's something that is pro probably pretty easy to figure out um, when the tides would be. And we'll talk about that more when I go over the tidal chart here in a few minutes. But yeah, Cho An Inas, the high tide on the full moon in May. Then we have Wed U Chawelgang. The tide is going out now. Chawelgang. Followed by Cho Ashandai. Cho Ashandai. The smell of the beach at low tide. I included that one mainly because it reminds me of the word. Uh, petrichor, uh, the smell of the earth after rain, kind of reminded me is like the smell of the beach at low tide. Yeah. <laughs> Choke Ashendai. It's a pretty phrase. Then we have Tagust u Kajugang. Tagust u Kajugang. The wind is blowing from the south. So these are important phrases that would have been like relevant for seafaring peoples, which, which the Haida were, right? They went by canoe a lot of the time. So knowing how to tell the direction of the wind can tell you about, you know, how you're going to be affected on the water in a, as a sea craft person, and also probably about how the animals are going to be behaving. So, and the weather, which is very important. So, to review, Tagust u kajugang, the wind is blowing from the south. Then we have Nagust kajugang, the wind is blowing from inside. So, I imagine that would mean from, we have uh, from the east, from the inside of the land right toward the the water um when you're on the the west coast in alaska right so from the inside would be blowing from the east east <laughs> nagust kajugang okay and then we have sagust kajugang it's blowing from the north sagust kajugang and then finally Jagust Kajugang. It's blowing from the west. Jagust Kajugang. 
or seaward side of the island. So there are some additional high def phrases I'm going to go over before we get to our uh, title list, as it were. Um, these are things that I mainly pulled up out of the dictionary and out of the Hide a Phrase book, but if you're trying to learn about tides, these are like phrases that might help you out a little bit. So I'm trying to group them together in a way that is useful for people. So our first sentence here is Chawastlu to Kwan Talang is Gangang. We always get lots of food when the tide is out, right? That's when you can go and grab up all the shellfish. <laughs> so, chawastlu to kwan talang is gangang. So, um, one of the important things to remember about gathering shellfish is that in Southeast Alaska is um, a lot of that is endangered by um, cruise lines and stuff. People can't harvest subsistence foods like they historically could because of some of the ecological stuff that's going on and toxic shock. So important, but it's, 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 an, it's an important cultural food as well. So then we have Awan Sahu Talang Isgandan Igui Gihidan. The tide came up on us while we were picking seaweed. Awan Sahu Talang Isgandan Igui Gihidan. So, and then we have Awash Adas Dlu Slang Esh Adai. Dang idan, dang idan. <laughs> I'll do that one more time for you. Awash adas lu slang esh adai dang idan. Long ago, when they were seining, they pulled the nets in by hand. So this is a phrase that can actually tell us a little bit about, you know, traditional harvesting practices. You know that we know they knew used nets. We know that they pulled by hand. It's anthropological information. <laughs> and finally, we have Chansi Gu Sukhungagung. The sea is milky there, as when herring are spawning, right? So these are like in things that would tell us about the time of year, about what we should be doing subsistence wise. So. It's, you, it actually, it might seem simple to just include sentences like this about the sea is milky, how, how important is that? But it actually shows us how much the Haida historically have understood their environment, the amount of transgenerational knowledge they have accrued about how the animals interact and how we behave with the animals so that we can sustain ourselves. It's pretty fascinating to me. And we also have Nalai Gangagang. The kelp is thick with fish eggs. Um, yeah, fish eggs are an important source of food um, to the Haida. And um, there are like instances of moving fish eggs from one area of another to encourage the salmon to come back to certain areas that they haven't before to expand the range and so yeah there's just like a whole bunch of ecological knowledge contained in all of these phrases if you're just pouring through the dictionary or the phrase book you can come up with all kinds of environmental information and I always want to stress that in these videos but rather than go on and on about that let's take a look at the Haida title calendar together now this calendar is compiled mostly from um, Swanton 1903 information so yet again as we were talking about with the Haida subsistence calendar video this calendar does not necessarily talk about the way Haida people practice subsistence or observe the tides today. 
this um, chart actually shows us more about how the Haida observed the tides um, in the early 1900s. So it can give us historical information, not information about the present. But we can understand a lot about the Southeast Alaskan environment by looking at this chart. So, so there are um, six low tides that are referenced as important, and then there are two high tides, um, which are, um, and they're Skidigit and Masset. So these are different um, regionally, like these are not going to be tides that are happening at exactly the same time as they would be in, you know, Southeast Alaska necessarily. You know, there are topographic things that are affecting the area and the time of year that you see tides, right? So we have one that people think is the main one but is not. We have a misleading tide and then we have a tide that marks the between month we have a tide that notes when hair seals are coming out and when early berries are starting to form, right? So by paying attention to the movement of the water, people are able to plan what they're going to eat in the springtime. You know what I mean? Like that, that is pretty insightful and like it takes generations of observation to come up with this kind of information where, you know, a culture knows how to like sustain itself based entirely on the ecology surrounding it. So yeah, when it's no longer cold enough for indoor fires, um, my personal favorite from this chart is Sandhill Crane's Break Things by Dancing, right? This is a tide, a, a movement of the ocean, basically, which is correlated to, like, feeding behavior of sandhill cranes. So this is environmental and animal data that is telling us how to survive, basically. It's, it's something really, really cool and not something that we in the Western world probably would think about in the modern times. We don't, you know, we don't live our lives by the tides today, but very literally the Haida people lived their, moon, their lives by the tides. There's a tide for the new moon in Masset and there's a full moon tide when shellfish are buried deep under the ocean, right? So I just wanted to share this with you. I don't have really good Alaskan Haida translations for these title names. And part of the reason for that is it's not really reasonable to try to translate these to Alaskan Haida because they don't pertain exactly to Alaskan Haida. But it's important cultural information and I am sure that there are specific Alaskan Haida phrases for tides and stuff that, you know, that, that information might be out there in the language in elders. That information might be in articles I have yet to come across, but, or it could be lost. This is, it's important to keep this information alive and have people be aware of it so that we understand like the depth of ecological knowledge that native people had. So anyway, this is something that I have accumulated through my studies that I wanted to share with you. And basically just to say, we really need to be treating indigenous knowledge, indigenous understandings of the environment as scientific data. We don't, it's not just, you know, archaic. It's information that we can use today, that we can learn from. And I'm just gonna keep harping on that. <laughs> so yeah. Um, next time we're going to be talking about um, health and the environment and how the Haida relate like physical and emotional health to 
health and respect for the environment. And so stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell. House Dunk King Song, the Monogun King.